Hello, my topic today is uh, about the uh, ERCOT winter storms, which have been uh, widely uh, publicized what happened. And they're actually sort of a test case for uh, America. I'm going to roar through this pretty quickly, so if, if I don't make a point very clearly, please uh, stop me. The other thing I will say, there have been many reports about the first storm, URI. Uh, the Texas Public Policy Foundation put an excellent report in August of last year, so I would refer you to that. Uh, the winter storms provide lessons for Texas, and uh, specifically these uh, entail integration of renewables into the grid, which we'll talk about. The Uri storm, if you recall, was uh, before the last uh, conference, and I would refer you to our talk uh, during the last conference, in which we went in detail. But uh, we're going to have to skip over a lot of detail for now for consideration of time. Since that time, we've had uh, winter storm Elliot, and we've learned, uh, compare and contrast these storms, we've learned a lot. Uh, we've learned a lot on the intermittency of green energy, which uh, I don't think people really appreciate. Everybody assumes you can have a one-for-one -one replacement. That cannot happen. Uh, in Texas, we've gone through a, uh, we're in the middle actually of a market redesign effort where we're pricing, uh, trying to re uh, revise our pricing policy to encourage dispatchable energy. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. My first talk was dispatchable power when you really need it, you really need it. This talk is uh, apples and oranges are not additive. Uh, key talk takeaways, the recent winter storms demonstrate weather dependent vulnerability of the ERCOT grid and will, as uh, all grids uh, add renewables, uh, they'll have more vulnerability. Wind droughts, which uh, people don't talk about, are very common uh, globally and we'll, we'll uh, look at uh, what happened during URI and look at what happened around the the world. Power crossed actually increase renewables. This goes contrary to what's uh, been publicly said by the renewable folks. I'll show you some data that uh, says that's not quite true. This is a fact. Since 2007, the pricing policy for the ERCOT system in Texas has, has provided no new dispatchable power, no gas, no coal, no new nuclear, all wind and solar, and that has implications. Uh, this is the ERCOT uh, system, it, about 90% of the geographic area of Texas, 26 million customers, 1,100 generating units, quite big. But what people don't realize is Texas also leads the nation in wind energy with over 13,700 uh, turbines, uh, 35 gigawatts of capacity, so very big on wind energy. It's a large independent power system and represents a national test case for integration of renewable power into a grid. Lessons on stability, pricing, policy, weather dependency, power costs, they're all obtained through studying uh, the ERCOT system. And I would particularly urge the people from Colorado to uh, take a look at uh, ERCOT. Uh, there, what happened during URI, uh, there was a frequency control uh, issue. Electrical grid frequency is a critical factor in, in grid stability. Loss of frequency control will result in power uh, damage to equipment for power providers, customers, transmission system, and a, and a uh, parameter called spinning reserve, which is provided by coal and gas, is a critical element for frequency control. Renewable power, un un unfortunately, is non-synchronous and does not contribute to the so-called spinning reserve and thus does not significantly contribute to frequency control. And this was the uh, essence of what happened during URI. If you look at the left side of the graph, it's 60 hertz is what you try to maintain. Normally, ERCOT, uh, through balancing supply and demand, controls it within a few thousand. What happened during URI is uh, power was lost. There wasn't enough dispatchable power. Wind power went down and we got into a period where we had four minutes of below 59.4 hertz. Uh, if we had had another five minutes, uh, we would have had automatic uh, interlocks kick in and uh, automatic load shedding. Uh, and below 59.4 uh, hertz for an additional five minutes could have triggered these automatic load shedding and resulted in a total grid meltdown with a black start, which sometimes requires months. As it is, there was a lot of, a lot of issues, a lot of pain and suffering, 250 deaths, 200 billion in economic uh, uh, impact, but it could have been a lot, lot worse. Okay, recently we had Elliot. We seem to have these storms in, uh, on uh, holidays. This one happened about Christmas. <laughs> uh, if you look at uh, the, the conditions, uh, one thing to note is it was not, Elliot was not as severe as uh, Uri. They were, uh, the actual load was 60.4 gigawatts. 
the predicted load was 70, which is significantly uh, less than uh, URI. Elliott was a dry storm, we know. There was no really precipitation in all the areas, although it did get, it, it did get very cold, but uh, it was dry. And that will come up here in a few minutes. Now, what happened, the ERCOT response uh, to URI, how did the grid uh, survive? Well, there was no frequency issue, and the load got high enough and there was enough supply uh, where you had actually excess of capacity of two to 3,000 megawatts, two to three gigawatts, but I will note the, the important number is the one that's circled there. Coal contributed 10 gigawatts, 10,000 megawatts, and in the current plan by the Biden administration is to shut down all coal power in the U.S. by 2030. If we would not have had that 10 gigawatts of coal power, even a storm as weak as Elliott would have had a significant impact on the uh, ERCOT area. So since URI, uh, there was a lot of uh, discussion, a lot of hearings, and a lot of legislative action. Did we fix the problem? Well, we didn't see the near disaster. Uh, there were, uh, ERCOT had a two-phase implementation program to fix the grid. They partially implemented phase one, which was the weatherization and the fuel facility. Was the problem fixed? The answer is no. Uh, the, the lower severity was the saving factor. Phase two is the one that's currently in progress. This is the important one. Phase two includes repricing power so that it incentivizes the, the uh, capital that's required for dispatchable power, namely gas and uh, potentially coal. Okay, let's talk about wind and solar. While the intercommunal fuel cost is zero, there are no operational greenhouse uh, emissions, but as Marty mentioned, there are a lot of uh, CO2 that's generated when you put in the physical facilities. Uh, they're, it's, they're highly subsidized and thus create a market distortion and their hidden socialized costs we'll talk about. And from a minute to minute standpoint, you have to balance the grid. You cannot supply the power, the demand and the supply have to be uh, synchronous and, and tightly controlled. Wind and solar are weather dependent, they're highly variable in output, and as Marty said, the, the capacity factors are relatively low, comparing design capacity to actual delivered power. Uh, they're non-dispatchable. They decide when the power is available. You don't decide. You don't turn up the dial. Uh, they have low energy density sources. The wind is a low energy uh, source, a low energy density source. So is uh, solar. And again, they have a high initial material requirements compared to other forms of electrical generation. I think Bob's going to talk a little bit about that. They both require significant backup. When the wind doesn't blow, you got to back up your power. And they have uh, impact on birds, bats, insects, and now even whales for unbelievable. Uh, two important observations. Uh, we keep hearing about uh, installation of wind and solar as a replacement for dispatchable power. This is not true. I hear they shut down a coal plant in New York and they put in wind. That's, it's not a one-for-one -one, uh, situation. In Europe, they found this out ahead of us. Idled coal and natural uh, uh, nuclear facility have been idled, but they have been since returned to service when they, when they found out that they just can't rely on the renewables. Wind power variability. Uh, if you look at the daily variability, this, uh, these are three days in August of, I think, 2021, where uh, on one day you start out with 15 uh, gigawatts of ERCOT uh, wind power in the, in the evening, and then it goes down to five. One, uh, the next one is 10 going down to two, and the next one is five going down to zero. So this is a 24-hour variability. The power that can be generated with wind turbines is proportional to the cube of the velocity. So if wind velocity goes up and down, you multiply that by the cube power, and you can see the variability is uh, accentuated. You cannot assure that adequate wind power is there by adding more turbines. You can't go from 13,000 turbines to a million turbines. If the wind's not blowing, it does not matter. This is an example of the seasonal variability of wind. It blows pretty good in the, in the spring, but by the doldrums in the fall and the, in the winter, it goes down. And since it's a, if the wind velocity goes in a half, the power you get out, it goes down tw to 12%. So 50% reduction wind velocity, 12%. 
so this is an example of the daily wind power output. If I'm in ERCOT in Tyler, Texas, I got to control, I got to balance the grid with this sort of variability. Now, uh, there's something called wind droughts, and you can see two minor wind droughts in uh, 2021, one in the middle of the uh, year and then other in the summer. This is when you have days of low wind velocity. We'll talk about this a little bit more. Wind droughts are global in nature. They're seen in all geographic regions. They're associated with stable high pressure systems that happen in both summer and winter where there's little wind. Yuri saw a five day prolonged wind period. You heard in an uh, earlier thing where wind, Epstein said wind got down to 1%, wind capacity got down to 1% of the, of the nominal capacity and that's true, it, it did happen. Uh, Germany saw a wind drought, we'll talk about, UK saw a wind drought in uh, 2021. Uh, this is what happened during URI, the yellow, uh, it, this is a map of North America. This is a barometric pressure anomaly where the yellow is a high pressure uh, anomaly. Uh, so if you focus in here, uh, the, the, uh, the high pressure anomaly and low wind velocity went all the way up to Canada. It was a very stable front. It idled turbines, even winterized turbines, all the way up to Canada. Elliott also, remember this was a dry storm, they had very little icing, but there was very little wind power in specific time. The only saving grace, it was only a two-day storm versus a five-day storm. Uh, this is what happened in Elliott on uh, Christmas. If you look at the green curve, that's the wind curve. The power went down. How do you compensate that? You run up the gas. You can see coal here pushing out power, so is nuclear. But what has to happen in our system is gas has to balance wind. You've got to have dispatchable power to balance wind. Uh, this is the German wind drought I talked about. It was a two-week uh, period in, in, uh, starting in April 2022. The yellow is solar. The dark blue is uh, all, uh, offshore wind. The light blue is onshore wind. If you look at the dotted line, that's your normal average. So what you had is a deficit for two weeks of wind power. And wind average during this period, three gigawatts, which was 5% of the nominal capacity. And normally you get about 24 gigawatts. They have about 60 gigawatts uh, capacity. So that's one drought. The same thing happened in the UK. We had about a one week outage in 2021 where gas had to compensate. This happens in Australia. You can have examples all around the world. What happens during the wind droughts? Uh, this is in UK, that uh, same period I talked about. They rely on natural gas for backup. What happened to the natural gas? The price spiked. They shut down uh, uh, industry at Teesside up in north of uh, Britain. Uh, sort of a mess. Uh, so the balance is becoming increasingly hard. We're putting more solar in. We're going from four gigawatts of solar to over 20. And in the middle of the day, you back out gas power. This is a so-called duck curve. Uh, uh, the observations. We have energy only pricing in which we back out uh, solar. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, you have a little bit of an outage when the sun goes down. And so you got to back this up. This is a, 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 a three to five gigawatt shortage. But remember, when you have wind droughts, you're looking at 20 gigawatts. And it really gets bad when you start shutting down coal. We've uh, looked at pricing. There's a PCM. Uh, pricing proposal that addresses this end of the day outage, but it does not address, in my view, the uh, wind drought issue. Okay, so we're talking about socialized costs. I'm gonna run through this very quickly. Uh, what are the socialized costs? Wind does not have to pay its full load. Uh, for instance, the capital costs of backup power, uh, and the higher cost of transmission because they're, they generate the stuff in uh, West Texas and it's go all the way to East uh, to the east where the population is, uh, less flexibility of timing. There are a lot of backup and uh, socialized cost. So the question is, is wind and solar competitive? Normally people quote the uh, levelized cost is a benchmark they use, but the levelized cost unfortunately does not include all these socialized costs. So if you put it on apples to apples basis, you get more like the graph that Marty was showing. Uh, this is a good example. Uh, what this does is look at the per capita wind, uh, wind and solar capacity in Europe uh, versus, uh, versus cost. And, and, and the, the bottom line here is when you add more wind and solar and you include the socialized costs, the real average cost of power goes up. I've seen this sort of presentation, this sort of analysis in a lot of different areas. This is Mark Mills, and he, uh, he did this for Europe. 
So if wind and solar are so cheap, why do countries with the highest renewable penetrations have the highest power costs? Okay, lastly, uh, grid inertia. We talked about, about spending reserve. Uh, frequency has to be maintained. There was no mention and, no, and very little understanding of grid inertia, but this is, this is a problem. If you don't have uh, the inertial backup, you don't have frequency control. And what's happening in uh, ERCOT, we're adding more and more wind and solar. In fact, by 2026, we'll have 40% weather dependent uh, uh, power and 60% dispatchable. That's <laughs> sort of down from 100% dispatchable in 2008. So this is a reliability issue. Uh, I mentioned the, pro the politicians are trying to redesign the process to get more dispatchable power. Uh, they passed an SB3 bill, the Fix the Grid bill, which they're looking at changing the power pricing policy in order to incentivize dispatchable power. It gives broad, uh, this uh, bill gives broad authority to the Public Utilities Commission. And uh, it, like I said, phase one is done, but phase two is the hard part. It's the pricing policy. Every state, every entity is gonna resolve this. You're trying to price apples and oranges, and it's really tough. Uh, okay, so uh, this is a, a busy chart. Right now, they're looking at five options. They, they uh, have a, a consultant that's recommended five uh, different pricing options. PCM is one they're focusing on. Uh, and I'll say, in, in, uh, to conclude, the PCM option is one that people are focusing on, but the, but the, uh, the problem is, I th my, my personal opinion, it does a very good job addressing the end of the day three to five gigawatt shortage problem, but it does not do a very good job with the wind outages and the wind droughts. So with that, uh, I will thank you. I know I ran through this very quickly. I'll be happy to... to uh, during the Q&A, I can answer some or stay afterwards. But uh, my next, uh, our next speaker is Bob Bauman, who has an outstanding uh, presentation in the nuclear area. And I hope I haven't taken any of his time because it's a really good presentation. So thank you very much.